right. Um, it is an honor to be here with our brothers and sisters here in the desert churches. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, let me just start off, and then, of course, my wife will start speaking, and uh, you guys will fall in love with her, and then you'll love both of us. All right, so... Uh, but uh, I just want to quickly say uh, thank you to your, you know, to, first of all, to the church, uh, second of all, to your staff, right? So, uh, Roy, Alicia, thank you guys so much. Makai, thank you uh, for being partners in the gospel with us. Uh, we especially want to thank the Sweeney's. Uh, you guys have, and I know you know this already, but we just want to remind you, just in case you've forgotten. Uh, you have an incredible couple in the Sweeney's. And uh, they're, one of, they're one of the major reasons we are here uh, in California. Uh, because I, I remember us uh, being in Columbia, and uh, I was driving one evening, and I was thinking, okay, so are we going to stay in Columbia, God, or do you want to move us somewhere else? And uh, we had just resolved to say, you know what, let's just let's ride out the last quarter of our life in the southeast, and maybe possibly in Columbia. And then, uh, then I got a phone call and some, some things changed. And then I, I also remember praying, God, I don't want uh, this last quarter of my life to be competitive or to be crazy. I want to just love you and have fun in the ministry, Amen. right? So that means I want to be around cool people. And so we had a meeting with, uh, with the Sweeney's and, and Sergio and Kristen, and we just fell in love. And so we're like, okay, God, we understand you. You've answered our prayers uh, because we felt like we could connect uh, with, this, with these couples and that we could build something amazing in terms of our relationship. And uh, so we thank you guys so much for just who you are as people and also just who you are as leaders. Thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel. Scotty, you, you are, both our names are Scott, right? So you can just say, we look like twins, don't we? <laughs> right? He's just a little bigger than I am, but other than that, you know. But uh, I, we love you guys deeply. Amen. Good afternoon, church. Um, I am so grateful to be here, and thank you guys so much for having us. And Scott and Danielle, you know, you have two um, very passionate people who love the Lord and um, have really deep biblical convictions, which I'm so grateful for. Um, they love God, they love the church, but they also love their family. And I think that's so obvious. And you guys, you set a great example. And, um, and definitely, Ron and Alicia, Mikhail, you know, I'm grateful. Grateful we're partners. Uh, in the gospel. Um, I will hurry up and get out of my husband's way here. I just wanted to share my story with you guys. Um, you know, I love all of the songs that have been sang today. You know, um, we have that same power um, through Christ um, that we were just singing about. And, and I think that's so amazing. Um, the same power that raised him from the dead. Um, I, I know has been used in my life um, through the scriptures. And um, I was born fifth of seven children, um, given to my maternal grandmother to raise and my step-grandfather. Um, I was born in Mobile, Alabama, but I was raised in Helena, Alabama, so away from my mom and other sisters and brothers. Um, I grew up with no indoor plumbing, heat or air conditioning, um, and we did have electricity, and we also had running water. Um, however, heat came from either the fireplace or a wood-burning stove. And um, we, um, growing up, I, I was an athlete, so I played basketball, played volleyball, and I ran track because I thought that was going to be my ticket out of Helena and to college. And so, um, but God had another plan. He actually um, gave me $250,000 to go to college at Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Um, so a private liberal arts university um, for a, a girl who came from, you know, no running water. I, I was totally out of my element. Um, the kids were just 
amazing, you know, their parents would fly them off to Vail for, you know, holidays and, and all of that. It was just amazing. I got to learn so much um, being in, in Granville, Ohio. So away from home was my first plane ride ever uh, to get on when I went off to college. And my grandparents had no clue where I was for four years. <laughs> so... So that was the other thing. I was totally on my own. And, um, but God provided me, again, just people. Um, I would clean houses when I was growing up and babysit. And so um, the parents of the people who I babysat and cleaned house for was Denison alumni. So they would send me money every now and then just to help me out, uh, to help me. Because I had to meet both parent and child um, you know, tuition fees. Um, for, for my portion, so um, they would totally help me out. So God, again, just throughout my life, God's hand has been there. Um, when I graduated, I moved to Boston, lived there for a while, was met by the church. Uh, unfortunately, um, it just, I wasn't humble enough to, to see God and accept God. And so it wasn't until I um, moved around with an organization called City Year, an urban youth service corps of young people 17 to 23 who um, do community service. So I was a team leader of those young people. And I ended up moving um, back to Ohio for the company and helping them get settled there. Um, but eventually I landed in Atlanta, Georgia. And God was so awesome and gracious to me. Um, I got a job with MCI, hated it. I'm not a salesperson at all. And, uh, but then I ended up working as a waitress at, a, uh, at the Gold Club in Atlanta. And I would get off work at 5, 6 o'clock a.m. Um, and I would go to church, uh, an early morning service, to give my tithe. So I was definitely a religious hypocrite. Um, <laughs> um, absolutely. But um, what was so awesome about it is that God saw that I needed him. And he provided... Um, a couple to show up in the parking lot the day that I, I came to the movies actually I came to see up close and personal and um, um, we had the the Daniels at the time to show up uh, and he said hey what is your name and I said like, I'm Theresa he said what are you here for I said to see the movie up close and personal he said oh my wife will go with you she said I will <laughs> I will she went to the movies with me that day and she changed my life she, she totally hugged me after I cried, after the movie, um, telling her this is the type of love that I want, that I, I desire, that I got to see on that screen. Um, that Thursday, she invited me over to her house for dinner and to study the Bible. She opened the scriptures to me, and she said, you know, I want to challenge you to live your life for Christ. And, um, and so that Sunday, she invited me to church. Um, that Saturday night, I got on my face, on my knees before God, and I cried out, God, why am I here? What is my purpose? Why am I still living? Please tell me. And I said, God, I need for you to tell me. If you want me to live for you, to serve you, I need you to tell me through the messenger that you have preached tomorrow at this church, that I am to quit my job and follow you wholeheartedly. That Sunday morning, I woke up in fetal position, tears, spittle everywhere. Um, I got ready, went to church. Ben Burnett preached that Sunday. He said, if any of you have a job that does not glorify the Lord, you need to let it go. <laughs> I was the only person in my one-bedroom apartment, okay? And I was like, if God heard me, he heard my cry. And that just blew my mind that God would listen to me, the biggest sinner of all. And um, I'm just moved by that. You know, um, I remember I got a job. Um, I went in that Monday morning, quit my waitressing job. And to his surprise, I totally quit. Um, and then I got a job with U.S. Healthcare. I moved to King of Prussia for a month. Um, I got to come home on the company one weekend that Friday night. I came to a singles devotional. I studied the Bible. Saturday morning, the woman, Stacia, who went to the movies with me, I went to see her sing at a wedding. And then that afternoon, I studied the Bible. Saturday night, I studied the Bible. Sunday morning, I studied the Bible. 
I counted the cost of becoming a disciple of Jesus, was baptized. I received, you know, I, I was, my sins were forgiven. I, I repented of all my sins and received the Holy Spirit. I was so blown away and so amazed by God. Um, and then back on a plane to King of Prussia to finish out my work assignment. But, um, but I just know that God, God's hand was in it all. Um, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. You know, this is Psalm 40. Many, the Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. God blessed me that day with love, his love. He gave me his love. He gave me a love. <laughs> um, but he also gave me three amazing girls um, who love me, though it's not easy. I know I'm not easy. They're not easy. <laughs> but we're making it by the help and grace of God. Um, but, you know, I am so grateful and blown away. Also, he's given me more mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters uh, in you. I have the church. I have a family now that I can call my own. Um, I'm so grateful, and thank you for allowing me to share. That's my girl right there. Yes. Uh, we're going to show you some of uh, my wedding pictures sometime in the sermon, right? I'm not just showing them just to show you. It's a part of the sermon. All right. Uh, but uh, let me say this. Um, he blessed me with an incredible woman, uh, as you can tell. And, uh, and I have three, like my wife said, three incredible daughters. Uh, they are a handful. Um, I think I have my mic on, so I'm going to turn this away. Is that okay? All right, fantastic. Um, and so it's an honor. Thank you again for allowing me to be able to share the Word of God with you. Uh, and uh, let me ask you this. Do you like living an excited life? Just shake your head, yes, or you shake your head, no. Are you living an excited life now? You are. Okay, fantastic. Well, you're the people I want to talk to. This is kind of my introduction. You know, I believe we all want to be caught up in an adventure. I believe that. I believe every human wants to live a life of passion and, and fire and excitement. You know, it's, I think about this often. When I, when I look at movies like, you know, like this movie here. No, that's not a movie. That's a picture of me. I'm the guy with that yellow uh, backpack. If you're looking at that and you think I'm lying, you know, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not telling you the truth. I'm lying. That's not me at all. But isn't that exciting? Isn't it exciting to just look at that, right? I wouldn't want to do it, but it is exciting. I'm like, my life is already exciting enough. Why would I jump out of an airplane? Anyway, any of you guys know, know this movie? You know, when I look at this, when I just look at the picture, the whole movie just come flooding back to my mind, right? And if you're, if you're a person that a that, that a, that's passionate, it like fires you up. Even though it's so violent, it fires you up, right? This is Gladiator. This is my favorite movie of all times. And I think it's like 25 years old or something like that. It's, it's really old. Anyway, I love uh, to watch this movie because, because it excites me. It, it makes me think about adventure. Um, it makes me think about passion and living an epic type of life. But you know, I believe if you are a disciple of Jesus, 
you are caught up in an adventure. And if you're not living an excited life or an exciting life, you have no one to blame but yourself. That's what I realize. As being a disciple, if I'm not living an exciting life, then it's because I've made a decision not to live that. Because there's so many things to really comprehend about what God is doing and what he has done, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about those today. But I just want to say this. If you are a part of the church of Christ, and I'm not talking about denomination, but if you're a part of Jesus Christ's church, that means that you're part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the temple of God, God's chosen people, his family. And you are in an adventure. Period. Now, you may come to church and you're like, oh, I didn't feel like that. Well, that's our fault as people. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute. Let's go to God with a word of prayer real quick. Father, we are so grateful to be able to be here today. We are caught up in an adventure. And it is your church And we're grateful to be a part of it. But we don't understand many times what it really is. And I'm asking your spirit to really help us today. Help me say the words and speak the words that you want to be shared, God, to help us truly understand what we are a part of. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of the body of Christ. We need you and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of the sermon is simply The Church. I was told that that the the theme uh, that you guys have been going through has been on unity, right? And so I figured, hey, what best, uh, you know, it's nothing better to teach about the church if you want to talk about being unified, right? And so that's what we're going to do today. Let's start off in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1. Thanks, bro. It says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, In the Lord Jesus, in in your love for all the saints, I have not stopped being giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called, or he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. All right, let me stop there for a minute. Who is he talking about? It says his incomparable great power for us who believe. For us who believe. Who is that? That is the church. That is the church. And it also says his incomparable power is for the church. And I don't know if you get this, But he's saying, or the passage is saying, that you have the power of God, that we have the power of God when we are are together as the body of Christ. That power raised Jesus from the dead. So somehow, as the body of Christ, as the church, we have that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. 
We're going to ask ourselves, do we believe that? It says, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. For above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every title that, he, that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet. Not just some things. Not just some good things. Or even some bad things but all things under his feet. So that means he is king, he is master, he is Lord. And appointed him to be the head over what? Everything for what? The church. Now who does that include? You and I. I want us to kind of grasp, like, I know we've read this passage a million times, but I'm asking you to grasp the depth of what this passage is really saying. Because Satan tried to blind the eyes of believers so that we won't understand the power that we have or that we have access to. Okay? So it says, God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. Now, is this the church? All right, this is one of the biggest churches in the world. Is that considered the church? No. This building that we're standing or that we're sitting in, is this the church? No. Are you sure? What's the church? Do you really believe that? Okay, so this passage is talking about you, not just 2,000 years ago in the church around, you know, that Paul was writing the letters to, but it also is talking about us right here, right now. Amen. Come on. Are you ready to go on an adventure? Yeah. Which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, right? The reason why we have access to the power of God is because we are a part of the body of Christ. When people say they, when they decide to leave Christ, they don't realize they're leaving the power of God as well. And it's not a physical building. We know this, right? If you're a disciple, you already know this. But I'm saying this to remind you because it's easy to get into, into the habit of just coming to church, right? Or doing the church things or being, quote, unquote, a disciple without tapping into the power of what that really means, when I think about this, I think also about, uh, you know, the, the references of, of the church, right? So in, in Acts chapter 9, you don't have to turn there, what, what, but it says, uh, Meanwhile, Paul or Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest, and in verse 4 it says, uh, uh, He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is Jesus saying this to Saul, and he's saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I'm sure Saul was like, well, who are you, Lord? I don't even know you. How can I be persecuting you? And see, the deal is, is that Saul was persecuting the church. He was trying to destroy the church of Christ. And Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Because when you persecute my church, you're persecuting me. And I think it's important 
for Christians to understand this, right? When we do something to the body of Christ or when you do something to your brother or sister, you're doing it also to Jesus. And Jesus is asking you, why are you persecuting me? But we'll talk about that a little more here in a few minutes. Or, or something like in Matthew chapter 25 when you have the, the goats in the sheeps. And Jesus says in verse 35, For I was hungry, and you what? Gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And they ask him, so when did we do all those things? In verse 40, Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers, of mine you did for me. One of these brothers of mine you did for me. You follow what I'm saying? So we're just not a group of people that come to church. We're part of something so, so magnificent. Do you understand that? I want to remind us. I know you know this already. And of course, this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, you don't have to turn there, like I said. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Your bodies are members of Christ himself. Now, it talks about, you know, a person should not unify themselves with the prostitute. No, I, I'm not going there in this sermon. All I'm saying is that, all, that we are a part of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, right? My first point, that's a long introduction, <laughs> but my first point is simply the church is the bride of Christ. And uh, this is when my wife and I got married and this has been 22 years ago, right? And that beautiful woman that's looking down on that church there, I don't know how the photographer did that, but it's awesome. <laughs> but I remember thinking, you know, um, like, who likes weddings? You like what? You better raise your hand, boy. You about to get married. <laughs> did he raise his hand? What's wrong with him? Macau, you trying to write. Come on. You need to throw that pen down, man. Raise both your hand and your feet. Right? Yeah. We all like weddings. Right? Yeah, that's right. We all like weddings. But you, I want you to think about this, right? I remember my wedding like it was yesterday. And uh, you can see the building there. In fact, I may have a better picture. No, that's, that's my wife coming in. I'll, I'll go to that one in just a minute. But you can see the building there. There's other pictures there. It was packed. And, you know, uh, we, we used the church, a Methodist church, for our wedding. And it, we were so rowdy. And I don't know, I mean, we weren't unrighteous like type, but rowdy. We were just acting like disciples of Jesus. And the church asked us not to come back anymore. Anyway, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Because, uh, you know, we played Prince's song, 1999, all that stuff. And they're like, man, you, are you sure you guys are Christians? Anyway, but, but I, I've always wondered, like, why do they treat the bride different than they treat the groom? Like, they had me as the groom to come out the back door <laughs> with the preacher before the wedding even began. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Maybe that didn't happen in your wedding, but I, I thought about it later. Now, at the time, I was fired up about it, but I thought about it later. I'm like, so why does the men get the short end of the stick in a wedding? <laughs> I'm just saying in the ceremony, right? Not with the spouse. I mean, that's, that's, my wife is the bomb. 
But I came out, well, like we came out, me and, the, and my best man and the, and the preacher all came out the back door. And we walked up there and we had to stand and everybody's just looking at us. And then they started to bring, you know, the little boy with the uh, ring. What'd you call him? Ring. Yeah, that boy. Uh, <laughs> the girl with the flowers and stuff like that. They came down and then the, um, the other people came down. <laughs> you know, when you get married, you don't care about nobody except the bride. <laughs> They're like, just bring my bride. That's all I want to know. Anyway, but everybody came in and that was nice. And then they closed the doors again. Right? And we all just sitting there waiting. And then music starts and the door swings open. And then you see this, like, I saw my bride. And she was beautiful. Like, in the, in, in the, 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 the hallway, or what, what you call this thing, the aisle, it was so long, right? It, it seemed like it was a mile away. But I could see her clear as day. And I was like, wow, she's beautiful. And everybody else that was there, like they were waiting for this moment. Right? They were waiting for, not for me, because I came out the back room. <laughs> they weren't really waiting for me. They're like, yeah, he's here. All right. He came out the back room. The, 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 the kid with the ring came down. The girl with the flowers came down. The other people came down. We didn't really come for them. This is what we've come for. Right? And you can see, like, I can peek through the door. I can see, like, people running around her. Like, and, and I guess they were taking her dress and trying to, you know, like, make sure her dress, I mean, the thing was so, like, I think it took like half of this stage up here, her dress, like this, what you call that, the train? Yeah, it was, it was just big, right? And so they opened the door, she's there, and everybody just like stood at attention, like, this is why we're here. And they faced, they like, you know, like, <laughs> like, they just, like, turned, and they looked. They took their eyes off of us, and they just, everybody at the same time, just turned and looked at her. And she just stood there like this, as people watching, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, wow, why does she... I didn't say this then, but I've just been thinking, like, like why does the, the bride get all the attention at a wedding? Have you ever wondered that? You haven't? Still, but of course, a sister is not going to wonder that. You're like, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. But the brothers, I'm trying to give you something to think about. Like, yeah, man. So, bro, when you get married, be like, no, I ain't coming out the back door. I'm coming in the aisle. Don't you do that. Anyway, <laughs> so she's, she starts coming down the aisle, and people who are watching the door are now are kind of shifting as she walks. And when she gets down to the front, everybody is facing front again. Like all the attention is on her, right? Because she's the bride. She's the bride. She's important. I'm telling you, at a wedding, there's no item or no situation more important than the bride. Without the bride, there's no wedding. You can have a wedding without the groom, but without the bride, no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Without the bride, there's no wedding. There's no wedding. You know, it's interesting. The concept of the bride and the bridegroom and the groom and all that, you know, is when you read scripture, and we're going to talk about this for a few minutes. Uh, Jesus in the gospel kind of give us some insight to how, uh, you know, like a, a, a Jewish wedding would, would, would go. And he, he ties that to the same perspective of how God's intent 
for the church, right? And the church is the bride of Christ, right? You, you, so we are the bride of Christ, and all the host in the universe is standing at attention, watching what God is going to do through his bride. And I'll show you what the Bible says, because the Bible says that, right? But I'm going to show you some more pictures. So she's walking down. Man, I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm almost in tears. I'm blown away. I'm happy. I had been single for three years before we got married. So I was ready. Okay, so, and this is when, you know, this is us. And, uh, you know, it, what I realize about... Um, being the bride of Christ, that we should celebrate a lot more than we do. We should celebrate a lot more than we do. You know, I remember she became my wife, and man, that was the happiest day of my life. Do you know our lives should be that way every day? If we are part of the, of the bride of Christ, that we should be, it's like it should be, the happiest day of our life. The happiest day of our life. And so in Revelation chapter, okay, let, let me go back. I'm not quite there yet. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Please turn there. Verse 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has what? Made herself ready. Wow. And what goes on in the preparation of a bride getting ready for her wedding is something magical. I wasn't back in the room, but I've heard about it, right? Like all the makeup and all the, how the, you know, the sisters are preparing her hair and putting lipstick on and, and you know, fixing the dress. and all. It's like making her ready for her groom. And so God is making her, us, ready for Jesus, right? We are the bride of Christ. It says, fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. The fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. It stands for the righteous acts of the saints. And I know in and of ourselves, we're not righteous. By ourselves, we are, we are sinful wretches. But with Jesus, the, all God sees is our righteous acts. That's what all he sees. And so, but Satan knows that. And Satan is always going to fight against us. And so we have to be aware of this. John chapter 14, verse 1. John chapter 14, verse 1. So don't you, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, also trust in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going away or going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. So th this right here, this, this passage is wedding conversation, wedding talk. So what happens in the Jewish custom is when a man wants to get married to a woman, he then builds a house onto his, uh, builds a room onto his father's house. Then he goes to get her 
and then he brings her home, right? This is exactly what happens. Like, that's what God is, te- this is what Jesus is telling his apostles. Listen, I'll be back, but I got to go build a room. I got to go build a mansion. I got to go build a house. I got to go prepare the place for you. And I'll be back to get you. I'll be back to get you. And we'll be together forever. So when Jesus comes back to get us, we'll go live with him in the mansion. And it won't be a mansion like we think of mansions. Like in Beverly Hills, (laughs) those are nothing compared to what we're going to have compared to what we're going to be living in, right? Nothing. We can't even fathom what we're going to be. But it says that Jesus said, I'm going to, going to go and prepare a place for you. And what I love about Jesus is, you know, when I think about his apostles, you know, at one point they were like his servants. But they transitioned. Like they, got a, they got a promotion, And they left servanthood, and he said, I don't call you servants anymore. You're my friends. You're my friends. In John chapter 15, verse 15, you can just jot this down. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his father's business. He said, instead, I call you friends. For everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And I think about that, being a friend of Jesus. And I think about John the Baptist. Like John the Baptist was what they call like a bridegroom. A bridegroom represents the groom, right? So when, say, for instance, business needs to be taken care of. The groom doesn't need to go because the bridegroom will go in his stead, And he would take your business before the groom even, like he speaks on behalf of the groomsman or the groom. Not only does he speak on behalf of the groom, he also protects the honor of the groom and the bride. That's what John the Baptist did. Think about it. John the Baptist came and he was preaching the word. Now, he ate some funny food, but he was preaching the word. He had some bad clothes, but he was preaching the word. Right? See, we are all like bridegrooms for the church. So when you come into the church, you don't come in looking, hey, what are you going to give to me? Right? This is your body. This is the body of Christ. You come into the church saying, how does she look today? We got to make the, the bride ready for the groom. She's got to be pure. She's got to be pure, uh, purity or beautiful or she has to be awesome. So when we come to church, we don't come to be served. We come to serve. We come to give. We come to make the bride Excellent, ready for the groom. So when someone is struggling spiritually, we pull them aside. And we love up on them. We talk to them. We engage with them. When someone is there that we don't know, we don't let somebody else walk up to them. No, we embrace them into the body of Christ. Why? Because we're the bridegroom. We're there to make sure that she is beautiful. If somebody is is, is breathing out threats against the church, we don't stand for that. If somebody is caught in sin and damaging the reputation of the bride of Christ, we don't stand for that. We don't stand for that. Why? Because the bride has to be ready for the groom. We got to protect the church. She is precious. No one needs to speak against the bride of Christ. 
If somebody spoke against my bride before, listen, I hadn't always been a Christian. I would knock them out in Jesus' name. I'm just saying. Brothers, you'll do the same. Yeah. You're righteous, but this is one time you'll step out of righteousness. Right now, I'm just... No, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Listen, the church needs to be protected because Satan has opened all out-and-out war on the church. Are you with me, church? And the way we protect the church is that we got to protect one another. Not the building. The building is going to be okay, right? If it doesn't be okay, it's going to be okay. But we have to protect one another. We are the body of Christ. You know, when it comes to the body of Christ, discipling is extremely important. And let me just tell you this. For the most part, we've gotten away from it. We've gotten away from biblical discipling. And so sometimes when we hear that word, we're like, oh, no, not that. It's a negative connotation. But it shouldn't be. It's beautiful, right, because it helps build us up. It helps build up the body of Christ, and so biblical discipling is a necessity. Without it, we just become a monument. We become like any other denomination. We become stale. And we become not the body of Christ. Not the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ is dynamic. It's growing. It brings glory to the Father. So in discipling, we got to learn how to balance relationships of life. So in Micah chapter 6 verse 8, you can turn there if you will. You probably already know this passage. But it says, "He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you?" It's, the passage says to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To, 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 to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. So, so when you think about discipling, you have up. So if you look at this triangle here, up is your relationship with God. It starts there. It says, in our relationship with God, we must walk humbly. Because if you walk humble with God, then you would definitely walk humble with man. But if you walk proud with God, you will also walk proud with man, right? All right, so you walk humbly with your God. And then it says also that we must reach in, right? So the in portion is really loving mercy. And so when you love mercy, that means you love people, people inside the church. So you show mercy by, you know, being a person that is full of grace and full of forgiveness and humility, right? And so that's inside the church. We should be very, very, very merciful with one another. We should. Because the deal is we all need, need mercy. Every last one of us need mercy. And then we should be justly, or we should act justly with people. And so I think about people outside the church, right? So, so many times we can be judgmental. We can be judgmental with people inside the church, but especially with people who are not a part of us. And that's just not right. It's not right. Like, how are you going to win people with that type of attitude? Just be just. Be fair. You know what I'm saying? Be, be gracious with people outside the church. We should always have these components in our discipleship. 
our relationship with God, our relationship with the church and with people that we, that we have relationships in the church, and then our relationship with people outside the church. Like, in our conversations and discipling times, do we talk about these three things? We should. It shouldn't just be, hey, I'm talking about my relationship with God. That's the only thing I'm going to talk about in our discipling time. Well, that's not going to get you too far, right? Because God has put us in community with people. Or we can just talk about just our relationship with God and people in the church. Well, that's good, but that's incomplete because he tells us, to go make disciples, right? Go help people who doesn't know him to know him. You got to have all three components. And we have to remind each other about these things. So that's, that's you know, balancing that, that uh, relationship of life, right? And then, you know, so when you do that, you just remember that dealing with people, there's always three components. One is that what you can do, what you bring to the relationship. The other is what that person does. And then the, the, the last one is what, what God does, right? So I can't do God's responsibility in somebody's life, even though I've tried to do that before, but I find myself frustrating myself and frustrating the other person because I can't answer or I don't, I'm not smart enough, right? But God is. And then people have to carry their own weight. I'm going to close out with my last point. The church is God's manifold wisdom. Satan doesn't want us to grasp um, the power that we have as the church. If we, if we ever grasp it, it will cause revival. It will call, it will call us to be completely different. It is a game changer. Are you with me? It is a game changer. Let me show you why. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 reads, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Peter, son of Jonah, for, you, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my what? And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So do you believe that the gates of Hades is fighting against you? Do you believe that? Do you feel it? All you have to do is look at the news. Turn on any channel with news, and you can see the gates of Hades is fighting against the church. But it says that he will not win. Satan will not win. Although sometimes it looks pretty bleak. When I see congregations are in turmoil and fighting one another, and there's attitudes flying with brothers and sisters, there's a vision. This last year, Satan had a field day. A field day with the body of Christ. He made a mockery at, out of the body of Christ. And guess what? We were a part of it. There was so much division, so much strife. It brought me to tears at times to see people who had been loving each other for so long now don't even like each other. Like, how can that be? And you call yourself a Christian? How can that be? 
But I think God allowed these things to happen to test us, to reveal what was really in our hearts, to show us that we've got to go deeper. We've got to be stronger. We've got to be more humble. Man, we had gotten arrogant. 2003 didn't help out much. You would think, man, man, we learned our lesson. But I, I told the leaders not too long ago, I said, God is not finished with us yet. We had learned some lessons we still need to learn, including me. Why? Because he needs his bride to be ready. To be ready. Amen. So we have to have the posture of humility. Satan cannot overcome it. So that means we've got to be aware that we are in a spiritual battle. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3. This is how we're going to bring it home. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 7. I become a servant of this gospel by the gifts of God's grace, given me through the working of his power. Okay? Although I am the least of all, uh, I'm sorry, I'm the least, then the least of, I'm sorry, I am less than the least of all of God's people that this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles this unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Now, when you read that, you're like, man, what is Paul talking about? He's speaking German or gibberish. I'm not saying German is like gibberish. I'm just saying I don't know either one, right? So anyway, but you're like, well, Paul, what does that mean? What are you saying? I'm going to break it down. All right, let's keep going, though. He says his intent was that now through the church. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You're like, man, that sounds really good. I don't know what it means, so I'm going to just keep going. Right? I did that for years, and then one day, the Spirit just say, stop and learn what this is saying. Okay. It's, a, it's an unveiling, right? It's a rediscovery of a mystery. This mystery has been kept hidden forever. And listen to who it's been hidden from, right? God knows, Jesus knows, but no one else knows. Not the angels, not the demons, not Satan himself knew what this mystery was or what this mystery is. And the church is the only way that this mystery will be unveiled. That's what this is saying. Okay, now let's read it again. Starting in verse 9. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent, God intended for this mystery to be discovered through the church. So in other words, you got the angelic beings, and we're talking about angels, we're talking about demons, we're talking about Satan himself. They don't know this mystery, but they're waiting and they're watching the church because the mystery is going to be unveiled through the church. Now, who did we say the church was? Do you understand why Satan is trying to keep you off guard now and keep you off of balance? Because if he keeps you distracted, you will never, you will never fulfill what God has planned for you. Right? His plan, God has planned for the church is for, is for us to reveal the mystery that he has had hidden forever. So what's happening is that the angels and the demons are watching the church and waiting for the mystery to be revealed. 
Do you know what the mystery is? You're like, oh, just tell me, what is the mystery? Well, it's manifold, right? Meaning it's multi-layered. Meaning it's like many colors of a flower. Meaning like it's many levels. And it says, you're like, well, I still want to know, right? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but no, I'm just kidding. But it's saying the manifold wisdom of God, meaning that God knows what it is. And this is the mystery. That, that God was bringing uh, a, a kind of peace to the world. And he used the Jew and he used the Gentile and he brought them together. And he allowed them to have access to him anytime, anywhere, with boldness and confidence. That's the mystery. You're like, man, I knew that. <laughs> See, this is the deal. We knew of it, but we're not living the adventure. We're not living the adventure. What we have as the church is the most powerful thing in all creation. It's the most powerful thing in God. What we have right here is the most powerful thing in all creation. It's telling the angels and the demons God's plan right here, us. And you're like, we're nothing special. We're not. But this is what God has decided. This is what he's designed to do. He's going to use us, us, the church. Amen. This is why we have to be unified. This is why we cannot allow ourselves to be divided. Amen. Right? We win when we are unified. And all heavenly creation is watching the church. You know, when I think about it, as I closed out, I should have closed out like 20 minutes ago, but I've been rolling, so I, just, I hope you guys are cool with this. I'm just going with it. I just say this. I just say this. If our leaders were smart, and I'm not trying to throw down any of our leaders. They, they're brilliant people. But if they really wanted to know some answers to some things, all they have to do is ask some disciples. And I'm not saying that we are, you know, in and of ourselves that we're brilliant, things like this. But we understand, we understand God's plan. We understand God. And so sometimes you listen to, you know, some of our leaders and we're like, man, if you would just humble out. Or if you would just, if you just would just get into the word of God, it will give you the answer to the issues that you're facing. Have you ever thought that? Not because you have some high and learning. I'm not saying that. What I am saying that God created this word, this world. He also has the answers to the mysteries of this world. And we who are disciples can help give answers to the mysteries of this world. Why? Because it's hidden in God. Is hidden in God. It's hidden in God. So church, we must fight for our unity. If there's anything that is hindering our unity, fight to get rid of it. When you come to church on Sunday or on Wednesday or any time the church comes together, remember you are coming to the bride of Christ. She has to be ready. She has to be ready for her groom. She is precious. Don't let anyone, including yourself, speak against that precious bride. Thank you so much for your time. To God be the glory. I'm going to pray for the communion. And as I pray for the communion, let us think about the community that we are in. Yeah. Let's think about Christ dying on the cross 
was the formation of the church, a new people. Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful, God. We're so grateful that you've allowed us to be a part of your family, that you adopted us as sons and daughters, and that we are, the Bible teaches that we are co-heirs with Christ. We're co-heirs with your son. God, I pray that we will always remember that your bride is beautiful and that we should be grateful to be a part of the body of Christ. Give us everything we need to protect her, a righteous heart, a sober mind, a humble spirit. Help us to remember your son Jesus died on the cross so we can commune with one another. This is my family. And even though I may not know them, I love them. Even though they may not know me, they love me. And we should not be strangers to one another. We need you and we love you. As we take communion, help us to remember that we are community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.